Atheist Nomads, episode 125, Angry Black Rant with Ishmael Brown. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Well, hey there, neighbor. How you doing? And joining us today is Ishmael Brown from the Angry Black Rant podcast. What up, what up? A.K.A. the H-A-N-I-C. That's right. And you leave it there. You don't go any further than that. Never. (laughs) Never. Man, I'm just... Come on, that's a awesome title. Thank you. I've I've gotten um a few correspondence from other uh black podcasters who were like, "Man, how come I didn't think of that?" Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "Cuz you're not the H and I C motherfucker. Keep it moving." There's other black podcasters? That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> not an atheist movement, just random. Oh, okay. You know? okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually like a couple, but I would suspect when you're in the- a niche within a niche that you would get, uh, you'd be have a lot of contact with both, you know, they could the crossover on both sides. Yeah. Sure. Especially since, um, because my co host isn't an atheist, we haven't done, we've been kind of, well, just because the podcast is basically like it's atheism, but I make sure I say, you know, seen through the eyes of an atheist. So we talk things, politics and things Mm -hmm. that aren't always about religion, even though for me, atheism is probably one of the things I want to, and I'm always aware when I don't. And I've, I've been listening to your podcast for, uh, probably about six weeks now. And yeah, definitely seems to be focused on, you know, a lot of the, the issues that the, the black community face in this country. So why is it that you find uh, the atheist angle to be so important with that? Well, for for me, just I mean, when I became an atheist, I I was, you know, I came out I've I came out to L.A. and I was I was a religious person. And then when I became an atheist, it was jarring to me because I never knew what atheism was until someone just presented a question like, why do you believe? You know, you seem like such a. He didn't say skeptic, but as much, you know, he he said, you know, you question everything except and and it was a religious guy who was asking me that. And he's like, I'm dumbfounded because you question everything. And then I finally said, you know, why am I religious? Let me look at it. And then once I did, <laughs> I was like, yeah, why the fuck do I believe it? I, this is <laughs> it, it was like I had like, you know how they say before you die, you have a flash of your life. I had a flashback of every stupid thing religious wise that I like parroted. And I'm like, I must have <laughs> sounded like a friggin' idiot. Cause my family, like I was telling Wesley, like we believe we were Pentecostal. So we believed in demons and we had, I mean, we were deep into it. So, and I don't know how much I believe. Well, obviously I believed it, but I would just like, like I said, parrot it. So, I mean, I remember being a kid, 12 years old, we would sit and listen to a book on tape about a witch who's now obviously a Pentecostal, but says we went to kill this religious person and outside their house, there were 10 foot angels protecting them. And to me, that was gospel. (laughs) That was true, you know, and I probably should Google and find what book that was because I should probably reread. But I remember telling people about that, being young, like, yeah, and 10 foot angels was outside this woman's home. And so, but (laughs) but when, when I, when I became an atheist, I mean, it was the most important thing in my life because I was like traumatized by religion. Religion was abuse to me growing up and it was tied into a physical abuse. When I realized that I wasn't a believer, that it was all bullshit. I mean, atheism became the most important thing in my life. And I'm an extremely practically obnoxious, outspoken atheist and couldn't stop talking about it, whether it be at work, whether it be in relationships. And and I started to just cling to, you know, first it was Hitchens and Harris and, you know, the the Four Horsemen and anything yeah. atheist. uh what is it? Uh, any kind of atheist show on YouTube. And then it moved to podcasts. And 
I mean, I have not, it hasn't let up. I mean, I listen to podcasts all day. It's almost 20 a day. I go to sleep, listen. So when I finally decided to start a podcast, it was an atheist podcast. It wasn't even a black podcast. I mean, Mm. it was my voice and it was me being a black person given his point of view, but I wanted it to be an atheist podcast. And if you look at the early episodes, it was strictly, or at least focused on atheism. Every yeah. every um, story was related to atheism. And I had, at first it was me by myself. Then it was a male host who I initially interviewed when my first, well, actually, no, well, no. Rondell, he was cool. Yeah, it was Rondell. Actually, it was Sabrina first, but I interviewed yeah. Rondell first. But it was Sabrina, who was my second interview, who came on as my host. She was a new atheist. Mm-hmm. And then that didn't work out. And then Rondell was my host. A co-host, and then that didn't work out. And now it's Kim, who is not a Christian, but she's not necessarily an atheist. And that, in a way, I felt like I've I've been aware of that and maybe not pushing them so hard. But after every episode, to be honest, I say, I need to go, I, I need to focus more on atheism because it's not like she's against it at all. Um, But it's not like it's just too atheist, just, you know. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll be honest though. Uh, Ron, I liked Rondell a lot and Kim, I was a little wary at the start. Cause like you were saying, she's, you know, not an atheist, but you know, she's starting to grow on me. So, you know what? She's all right. Yeah. You know, like she, she I, gets this white guy's approval. I like, <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> I like our back and forth. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what I was looking for. Cause initially I was like, I mean, I never thought I can do it by myself. Cause no, I, it, to me, you just need someone else to bounce stuff. I mean, you can't just talk into a and expect it to be entertaining and ex- the energy to be up. Or maybe you can, and I just can't do it. I shouldn't say you can't do it because I love um, atheistically speaking. You can, but you got to script the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. At that point, you're basically just preaching. Yeah. Ex- yeah. And and I don't want to do that. I I just want to be my conversation with people. And I've actually been um, talking to a few listeners and a few other people to try and have more people on, namely atheists, so mm. we can talk about um, atheist thing or things that affect the atheist community. Like I have a few. I have this one Christian woman coming on this week. Oh shit! And I have a few um, African American atheist black women who have been um, were in the same Facebook group, which is a black atheist Facebook group. And we've been surprised by the um, misogyny in it. Um, Mm. So we're going to talk about that being a black and stuff like that. So I'm definitely going to start bringing more atheist topics to the forefront because those are the things that to me uh, are more interesting because I'm a black atheist. So I'm outside the black community. I'm as just maligned within the black community, at least the black believers as the white community, probably even more because black people are very religious. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So it was definitely something I wanted to uh, start focusing on. Cause so yeah, you, when you're, you're, you're black, your, your options are Christian or Muslim, right? Not even mu- Muslim. Well, at least, well, just from my uh, anecdotal evidence, yes, there are black Muslims in America. A lot of them, um, so, well, some of them are nation of Islam, and then some of them are black men who went to jail and found Islam. And I guess they found them other ways, but those are the experiences I've seen. But within the black community, they are shunned a lot hmm. because in Christianity, at least, it's funny because when I look at black Christianity or Christians who happen to be black, they are almost all evangelical, no matter what denomination. They Mm -hmm. believe the Bible literally. And I've been having conversation after conversation and they, they all remind me of Southern evangelicals. So they are so against Islam. They rather you, I, I mean, uh, I had a family member who became a Muslim while he went to jail and it almost seemed worse instead of him being a lapsed Christian that was committing crimes and stuff. When they found out he actually became a more peaceful person. But the fact that he was Muslim and was worshiping, quote unquote, the wrong God, because Christians is too <laughs> stupid to know it's the same frigging God. <laughs> they looked at him like he was a devil worshiper. It, oh, it nice. would have been better if he was running the streets, shooting people, because at God. least Jesus may save him one day, you know? Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but with what you said about how black Christians are all evangelical, basically, 
I one weekend uh, in my church worship ministry class in college, we went to the Black Adventist Church and Black Southern Baptist Church in Seattle. And there's black people in Seattle. A few, yeah, a couple, yeah. <laughs> okay. enough to have a couple of churches. Okay. And they, the the two churches were virtually identical. The only substantive differences were which day of the week they met on and the protein sources in the potluck. Mm. <laughs> Other than that, it w- there wasn't really any difference. Yeah. And even the protein of the potlucks, uh, yeah, there just wasn't any ham at the Adventist one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that sounds real sexual, protein of the potluck, like, like someone was... <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I immediately thought of fight club and soup and uh anyway. I'm, sh- I'm okay. sure it's halal. You know, geez, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, seven day of Venice. I have a few of them in my family as well. I mean, we run the gamut. As, as long as it's ext- and and maybe I and I guess I should come clean. I'm actually my family's not African American. They're um my mother's from Costa Rica, my father's from Trinidad. Uh, and a lot of my Costa Rican side, which I know the most, are like Panamanian, um, West Indian, Jamaican, and stuff. And maybe, I mean, but as I recall, you got a touch of Santeria in your family too, right? Yeah, exactly. So okay, so you're more Afro Caribbean and Hispanic. Ex- yeah, but um, well, yeah, um, but even but a lot of the churches we went to, there were a lot of West Indian churches, but quite a few African-American shirts and maybe they just gravitated towards the most extreme. So I couldn't say a hundred percent, you know, cause I know moving out to LA and I've dated a couple black women who went to um, black churches and they seem liberal. And I don't know how normal that is, but everyone else, even people I meet in on Facebook, uh, this one girl who her and I have been going back and forth she looks at the Bible literally. She doesn't trust evolution. And that's the norm that I've seen. And it's so weird because it's like, that's just evangelicals. But within the black community, and like I said, I, I don't have a poll, so I can't say 100%. It seems like they're pretty extreme as well. And I can see the distrust of um the government and distrust of because that's what I get from her. I didn't have that necessarily growing up. It was just religion. But I can see where black people would gravitate towards not trusting uh, what what's been especially atheism. So, but the funny thing is, I always bring up, I'm like, well, who the fuck gave you that religion? (laughs) You know, slave masters. Mm -hmm. They shoved it down your fucking throat. But it's like they're so far removed. It's hard to get that. They're just like, well, I don't know. They find. Well, just, just because their something. slave masters gave them that religion doesn't mean it's not true. Exactly. No, exactly. exactly. That's <laughs> it, one thing I, I, I've definitely noticed is it seems that the more diverse a Christian denomination is, the more segregated it is, which makes it so that your pastor will always look like you. Yeah. Even if he's reporting to an old white man. Yeah. Didn't I, I think they said who was it? Martin Luther King or someone. Uh, the most segregated time in America is Sunday. Uh, and it that because it literally was like the last thing you're gonna segregate that's why they were attacking churches and you know, but um but at the same time it said, I don't know, that was up that those were the first few places that started to segregate and or desegregate and but then I always say, Hey, wasn't Jim Jones like a leader of desegregation? Wasn't he like the white pastor <laughs> bringing in all these black people? Then he brought him out to an island and said, mm-hmm. hey, drink some dirty Kool-Aid and let's go to heaven. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I think Sunday's always going to be, say, you know, a black. The fact that they still say, a, do they say a black anything like a black church and black people uh, worship God different? And they do, you know, a lot. But there are a lot of Baptists. There are a lot of there are a lot of Southern Baptists who know how to get down too. You know, it's like it's not just black people who know how to jam. Oh man, <laughs> we have uh, three churches that are basically almost completely primarily black in Bremerton, and one is Emmanuel Baptist Church. And yeah, holy shit, you know <laughs> we we went there a few times for like Easter, Christmas stuff like that. You know, people dancing. I mean, for white people going into a black churches that was crazy <laughs> blowing my mind because you know if we even like 
moved like swayed just a little bit you know that was weird but <laughs> everybody's in the aisles dancing and then the, yeah. the potlucks afterwards just so fucking awesome yeah yeah and that's yeah. an atheist now because uh, in, in, in my black atheist group people will show videos of that it's embarrassing to watch like what are you fuck what are you doing like ah uh, it's the people uh, losing their shit rolling in the yeah aisles. but it isn't as bad as because like i said pentecostal we necessarily didn't dance we caught the holy ghost which is just a whole <laughs> different type of fuckery you know it's like <laughs> they're just flopping out of the crowd speaking it to uh let's get more into uh the whole pentecostal thing after a quick break Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Atheist Nomads. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Atheist Nomads. Okay, so the the Pentecostal churches you attended were they predominantly black churches? Yeah, uh, all black, as far as okay. I remember. And did you ever go to a white Pentecostal church? No, but See any differences there? No, no, I haven't, and okay. I've only seen them through. I've only known about them through our podcast. But my grandmother, who I ended up moving to at a young age, who was uh, while I was like thirteen. She was a Jehovah Witness, believe it or not. And she was like the only black person in the church. Um, But she actually, in a strange way, respected our... I mean, we were just kids. My sister and I, we would have went anywhere. But she still sent us to Pentecostal churches as she went Hmm. to Jehovah Witness. But we did go to her church a few times. And it was so strange to see a quiet church full of white people (laughs) and nothing happening but just reading for it was the most boring thing I ever saw in my life. Exactly. Yeah. But I don't know about white Pentecostal churches, to be honest. But I've heard it's pretty much, you know, I've seen video of them flopping on the ground, speaking in tongues. and So so what's a uh, what was your experience with the Pentecostal church like? It was, um, it, it was, it wasn't, well, as a kid, I didn't see anything bad from it. I saw people, like I said, speaking weird languages, flopping on the floor, but it was just like they taught God through, um, Armageddon and through the devil's coming to get you and through you're going to burn forever. They, I didn't learn about Jesus's love. And I think that may have been a benefit for me, even though as a kid, it was terrible because I, I grew up having nightmares about being burned to death, but it made it easier. I feel for me to leave the religion because that was something that was nice to walk away from. I mean, it was just about torture and, and uh, put it this way, the type of church I went to, and you may have heard this before. They passed out a list of, um, of, uh, what would you call it? A brand that were devil worshipers. Oh, and they said, you yeah. can't mm-hmm. buy anything from these brands, you know? Nice. And, and, and it was like Procter and Gamble. And it was like, cause they <laughs> have the market of beasts. And, and if you buy from them, you are, cause I think they're, um, their logo was a wizard or something. I don't really remember. It was, was something young. with the logo or, Doing uh, the the numerology stuff with the the name. Oh, was it? yeah, it was something like that. But I remember that being a big thing. So we were they they sort of market the beast and everything. They sort of devil. I, I remember coming home. This is one memorable uh, thing that happened to me. I came home once, and I said to my aunt, and my aunt's this super religious. Uh, well, everyone in my family was minus my grandmother, luckily, because she was a Jehovah Witness. It wasn't that extreme. She just kind of praised God and whatever. But everyone else in my family were ultra religious. And I remember after coming home and learning, and I actually think this was wrong, but you learned that Jesus was described as feet of brass, hair, or wool or something. And I remember and we had all these pictures of Jesus and on hand, blue eye guy. Oh, and I said, way. and I was like this child, and I was like probably like 10. And I said, hey, how come Jesus looks like that if in the Bible they said, you know, and my aunt ran up on me as if I said a curse word. And she said, that's the devil. That's the devil. He's getting you the question. 
Don't ask any questions. Just praise the Lord. That in wow. everything you did that's wrong was the devil in you. And it was like, so if you, you know, you're thinking about sex, that's the devil. Oh, you're watching that. I remember my sister, <laughs> uh, Dirty Dancing came on TV. My sister was dying to watch it, but it has this opening dance scene with people grinding on each other. And that was the devil. You little children, that's the devil in you trying to get you to watch that. I mean, it was a, it was a terrible <laughs> childhood. Everything was Satan coming to get you. That sounds like fucking. <laughs> And Adam Sandler in the Water Boy. Yeah, exactly. Every, everything's the devil. <laughs> everything's the devil. Fool's balls, the devil, right? <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's like I didn't learn about. You would swear the devil was more powerful than God. The way they talked about it, because I, at least in my memory, I remember more about the devil than about God. <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's all about hate and fear than it is love. Exactly. Yeah. Not not that once I read the Bible, I'm like, wait, God's not love either. <laughs> this guy's, he's the devil too. <laughs> Might as well be fucking created, huh? Seriously, and decides not to stamp him out with a thought. I I'm assuming since. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Did you ever speak in tongues? No, I didn't. I didn't. And and it's funny because my sister and I was uh, talking about that. And the only young kids that I remember speaking in tongues who were like, let's say, 17, that was sort of in our age, were like, to us, because my sister and I were actually really good kids, you know, we were like still innocent. And But the kids who spoke in tongues were the most devious. They were the ones who you knew would stale when no one's looking. And that <laughs> makes sense because it was all a sham. Like later on, I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, because they just kind of said, oh, OK, if I can sell this. I'll get accolades because whenever a kid spoke in tongues, they were praised. That was like someone to show how great God is. Look at this young child who can hear, like who can talk this, uh, you, you know, the language of whatever the fuck Jews or God or I don't even know. But yeah, so it was weird that the, the, the nice, innocent kids couldn't speak in tongues because we actually believed it was real. And I feel like the more cynical kids caught on and was like, I can just bullshit it. <laughs> How you you know, and and that's who always seemed to do it at a young age, anyway. Mm. But yeah, no, I could never speak in tongues. That that I I was I literally just sat with my eyes closed, waiting for it to happen. I didn't know wow. you had to kind of put on a song and dance and make it happen. <laughs> Shut so, about a Honda. Exactly. Hum, blah, blah, blah. In, uh, about in, a Honda. Uh, flopping on the ground. That, that's what I noticed the most. Less than speaking in tongues was adults flopping on the ground. I, that was kind of terrifying to me because that just doesn't happen. You know, like if a kid just starts playing on the ground, he'll get yelled at. And then you see these adults who you only see walk upright flopping on the ground as if, and it didn't look good. It didn't look holy. It looked terrifying. That, I always thought they were having like seizures and shit. Ex exactly. It's it's not a good thing. And it's, a, you know, the, the pastor will an anoint your head with oil and push you down. And uh, it, it was not a pretty <laughs> sight as a child. It just sounds scary as fuck. It is. It, it's, it's, and it's, and, and now that I, once I, the reason why I'm such an anti theist, once I stop believing, like I said, it was like this flash of just total embarrassment. And I just want to shame all those people. I wish I could be, <laughs> if I could go back in time, I'll just go back to the kid I was and be like, what the hell is wrong with you people? This is stupid. <laughs> this is the dumbest shit I ever, <laughs> and they'll just say I'm the devil and probably choke me to death. But, oh, it's so stupid. <laughs> Man. And when, when you get the, well, non-Pentecostal look on it, that's the, all the symptoms of being uh, demon possessed. Yeah, exactly. No, you're right. It it is. It, I don't see how that's not demon possession because if you look at Catholicism, yes, and they talk about you know the person's possessed and they're speaking a different language and they're uncon they have any seizures or whatever. Yeah, that's demon possession. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. And of course, to any rational person, it's epilepsy. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah, it's meant to it's it's it, yeah, that's usually what it is. I mean, in Pentecostalism, I mean it's just basically bullshit, which it, at least it well, maybe because in Catholicism it's like those people actually need help. And people who are Pentecost I don't think they're having seizures. I think they're just full of shit, but they're tricking themselves into thinking this is how I should act. But when 
in in a lot of other religions, when they say possessed by the devil, I mean, some people are faking, you know, you, you can see videos on YouTube where they're speaking with, but some people are literally, like you said, they have epilepsy or they some other kind of issue that needs medical help. Mm hmm. Yeah. But most are probably just faking and it's not hard to fake those kinds of convulsions. I figured that out how to do that as a kid watching videos of, uh, there was some show with a, uh, pilot that was or going I think it was astronaut training and they were going through the high G test oh yeah and mm. watching them pass out and saw several during that show I figured out how to mimic it perfectly and my <laughs> mom looked at me and said don't ever do that around your brother That's because my brother has epilepsy oh, <laughs> and it looked just like a seizure oh man <laughs> oh that's funny it wasn't quite right. grand mall but Pretty close. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow. You know, and if a kid can can figure that out watching, seeing it on TV a couple times, that would be so easy for somebody growing up with how that's how you're supposed to act to exactly. start doing it. Yeah. I think it's it's more amazing that you didn't do that and speak in tongues. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know why I did it. It just, that just never seemed, you know, looking back, it never seemed possible. Like, I always say I was very religious. I prayed when I woke up. I prayed when I went to bed, but I never felt anything special ever. Like, I never, never felt heard any, anybody answer you back. Exactly. Never. I, I've, now that I think about it, I, I felt like, and maybe that's how I was so quick to go to, to leave religion. Because I never felt any special kind of connection to anything. I just felt like that's what everyone did. Like, okay, we go through the motions, even though at the time I didn't feel like it was going through the motions. But I know a lot of atheists and a few people I know who left the religion who said, but I did feel the, you know, connection. And, and I guess I got close to that actually towards the end when I was older, when, um, I was diagnosed with cancer in college. And, um, and my sister took me and I was like going through radiation. So I was like really weak oh, and, and, um, I was scared and my sister took me to a prayer meeting and I think I was just emotional and I felt like better while I was there. I didn't feel any connection with any higher being, but I remember telling her while I'm here among your friends in this prayer meeting, I didn't feel the pain I felt and I was having like pack. Um, and I didn't feel that. And she was like, that's God. That's God. And, and at the time I'm like, yeah, it must be. Cause why would I all of a sudden feel good? But I never, it never felt anything spiritual or I just kind of was like, Oh, I guess you're right. If I'm not hurting while I'm here with you guys, it must be true. But, um, yeah, I've never felt anything, uh, quite. I felt like kind of like the devil was behind me a couple of times, but that's really? just, you know, yeah, I, that was also around that time while I was going through it, but I was just like on the, all this medicine and painkillers and, you know, um, being emotional. And I, I had this, I was still in college and I, w I was like, just, uh, just, uh, overdoing it. And I was still trying to play football while I was going through treatment and I just was up for more than 24 hours and I was having these anxiety attacks and I just felt like the devil's behind me. And I remember calling my sister and she prayed with me and oh, and it was just, it was just being just emotion. You, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was able to really look at it for what it was. But at that, in, in that moment, if I, I just kind of put a name and my sister probably helped push me there because I just put a name to my, fears and anxiety and everything else. And she just was like, yes. Cause like I said, growing up, everything's Satan. So she's like, that's <laughs> just Satan. And, and she's like, don't turn around. And I began to like buy into it. Like, okay, Satan's behind me. If he's going to be there. And, um, but yeah, that was probably like the lowest moment where I felt something supernatural, but I think it was more like I was convinced it was, but I mean, even before I became an atheist, after that moment was up, I never felt like that was true. I almost felt like, man, that was bad that I was thinking that. You know, I never mm -hmm. felt like that was a moment when the devil was behind. So, you know. I, I know my delusional thoughts really started with, uh, it was after poisonous spider bite. I had a terrible infection. I was on taking 2.7 grams of antibiotics a day, and mm. I had pneumonia on top of it. I was in really bad shape, and 
there was enough screwed up throughout my entire body. It's no wonder my, my, you know, rationality was compromised. Yeah. And when you, when the thing with, with religion is it, people try to strike when you're weak, when you're vulnerable. Oh, fuck. Yeah. If you're mm-hmm. sick, yeah. <laughs> fucking ambulance chasers. And exactly. Ambulance in your chasers. case, cancer, that's prime time. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like totally losing my identity. I was an athlete. I played sports my whole life. I'm trying to play, continue to play sports so I don't lose that identity while I'm going through this thing. And yeah, I, I mean, I was cracking. I was, and I'm trying to stay in college and do tests and taking caffeine pills to stay up late. So yeah, it, it was just the, I, my body was totally breaking down all at once. Yeah. And, but I'm glad I never, even though in the moment it worked, I was very, I was highly suggestible, but it never lasted. Cause once that moment left, it wasn't like I saw that as some defining moment where I should get closer to God. Once the moment was gone, I was like, yeah, pretty weird. But I never really was like, okay, that means, even though I was still praying morning and night and throughout the day. And, you know, I prayed over my meals. I was, it's weird for me to say I was very religious because, again, I don't know how much I bought into it. I definitely knew there was God and I knew I should be praying for him. And I was thankful when I woke up. But I never felt any need to go further than that. You know, that was enough. Yeah. I don't know. And obviously I was still partying and, you know, I wasn't this devout Christian who was avoiding, I was having premarital sex and partying. So obviously, <laughs> you know, like it was not, I just, I, who knows what I thought at the time. I just, I felt like that was enough. Maybe because I grew up around a bunch of men, especially who were doing the same thing. They said they were religious, even though their actions were just being regular people, but they always gave glory, always prayed, but Whatever happened in between that just happened. So kind of going for that standard party on Saturday, forgiveness on on Sunday. Exactly. Yeah, that was me all the way. And that was most of the people I knew. There there was only very devout women who like, to me, they could have been nuns because they clearly sacrificed themselves not only for God, Oh, but for the horrible Jesus. shit bags. Yeah, they were wet because the shit bags were running around cheating on them and doing all this stuff. But the oh, women, yeah. man, they they lived it, you know? But the men just did whatever the fuck they hey, Do you know why that is? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know because the way women are told to behave in society and boys will be boys maybe and you add religion to that and, and also, you know, it's a patriarchal kind of thing where when, you know, because because the men knew how to use religion in their favor as far as honoring them. And, you know, you can pull the passages out that say, you know, the men submit to Jesus, but you submit to the men type of thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm mm-hmm. sure it's a mixture of that and it's a mixture of their culture. I mean, like I said, they were West Indians. So even without religion, it's a very patriarchal culture. And so I'm sure it's just a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff, you know, immigrants in America and just totally the women just like, you You know what it reminds me of? Like, I read the book, The Godfather recently, and it's actually not a great book as far as writing. <laughs> but at the end of The Godfather, Kay, who's this westernized woman who marries Michael um, to this Italian. And at the end, when she kind of acknowledges who he truly is. At the end, after that, because in the movie, it ends on that. Like, they shut the door on her. Like, Kay looks and can see when the guy kisses his hand and says, you know, hello, Godfather. She realizes in that moment everything he said he just told her he didn't do, she can see he did. And in the book, it's actually pretty poetic. She says looking at him reminds her of statues in Greece of men, great men, you know, whatever. Um And then at the end, she ends up going to church with the mother and she asks Michael's mother, you know why she goes? And she says, we women go to pray for the sins of our husbands. So it's almost like it's like being a nun. They're kind of saying, well, our husbands are doing evil things, but that's what men are told to do. Almost like men go to war, but us women must sacrifice their lives to kind of uh, pray Balance and make out. a pen. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I feel like that's how, and when I, I remember reading that and being like, that's what I grew up in. It's this 
Um, and, and it's, you know, I'm sure it has to do with, uh, the cultures they grow up in. And it's just women making that sacrifice for their men and men will do things. I'm sure they see it as men being soldiers in an army kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I think that's a lot of it. Yeah. There's a common thing in a lot of Christianity of people wanting their pastor to be the Christian that they wish they could be. And Mm. it sounds like women being the Christian, they wish their husband would be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I think you're right. I mean, because I I mean, at least in what I've seen, women are women make the sacrifice. And even in, you know, and you look at uh, Italian culture, my roommate, uh, his family's from Spain. Um, His mom's from Spain. His father's from uh, uh, England. And his mother is the ultra religious person. And she's okay with being a husband who my roommate's like, she's pretty, he's, he's obviously an atheist, but it goes unsaid, but she just kind of prays for the family and prays. And he's an atheist and she won't acknowledge it. So it's almost (laughs) like the mother just feels like that's what they do. They, you know, they, (laughs) they pray for the family and uh, they just sacrifice their themselves for it, I guess. Something I've always, something I've noticed, uh, over a long period of time is that you know fucking guys are always the leaders of the churches but it's always the women that keeps those those churches together Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) if if the women weren't around the fucking churches would fall apart (laughs) and we wouldn't we'd we we might we might have some cult leaders here and there but fuck i don't think we'd have church over all this time if if women weren't the fucking glue exactly yeah because you need someone to be subservient and to take on the burden and average church attendance across the u.s is 60 about 60 to 70 percent women wow. and and how many of those you know 30 to 40 percent of guys are getting pulled along yeah because <laughs> they're not man enough to not go because <laughs> they're not man enough to sit on the fucking couch and watch football like every yeah. other drunk drunk and and I don't know the numbers, but I remember reading an article that said black women are the most religious people as far as demographically. Um, I wouldn't, and, I wouldn't and, doubt that from exactly, childhood. And that makes sense. Yeah, it makes they're in the they're in a community that suffers a lot. And yeah. I can see women clinging to really. I mean, my sister and a lot of women in my family, I know weren't necessarily religious through their teens, but it's almost like they reach a point. I mean, they were religious, but they become ultra religious when they reach a certain point in their life. And it, it was, it's a weird thing to see someone just turn. And then all of a sudden it means so much more than it ever meant to them. All right. Well, let's take another quick break and then we'll be back. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at Atheist Nomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. So Wesley and I are both white. Uh, You know Our listeners are (laughs) 70% in the U.S. and pretty heavily west coast at that and so i would presume our listeners are vast majority are also white uh one thing i've i've noticed on your your podcast is covering a lot of stories of white people treating usually white people in power treating black people poorly are we talking about the fuck boy of the week yeah that's that's definitely part of it (laughs) Is it really? I never noticed that. Is it a lot of white people treating black people poorly? Yeah. I just look at people I don't like. So I <laughs> It's white people in power, yeah. Uh-huh. I I should uh write out all the fuck boys and look at it. Pretty much aside from like Carson. Yeah, it it's pretty much all black uh all white guys. Yeah, the fuck I don't know. Boys. Last week was a uh, was um the two black women who stumped for Trump or this week, Monday. Mm. I haven't listened to the latest show. Well, yeah, I'm behind. Well. I was in Cancun last week. Oh, well, stop burning. I've, I've yeah. actually in Mexico. <laughs> Say you were in Mexico. That's less glamorous. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, I, there, there, some episodes, uh, there's major stories, like the, the one with the, the teen that got pulled out of her chair and slammed oh. into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Off and, a slam. 
Thanksgiving, you you covered uh, the. Uh, there was a story that the media didn't even pick up. I didn't hear about it aside from your show. Which one's that? I don't remember. Well, rather than going into the specifics, though, yeah, uh, there's. I know for me, and I tr- I try to pick up on you know pay attention to to this stuff. Uh, but living in Idaho, growing up in in Southern Oregon. Uh, going to college in Eastern Washington, I have not lived with much diversity in my life. And when I have lived in areas with more diversity, like when I was in the Seattle area, it was mostly uh, Asian. And I, I know I've had very little exposure to what life is really like for black people in much of, of the United States. And I'm sure the same is true for a lot of our listeners, especially yeah. people who live in the Northwest where everything looks pretty good. You know, aside from me, you know, going to a few black churches when I was pretty young, um, I actually grew up, <laughs> um, actually, uh, knew Sir mix a a little bit. Uh, you know, he was, mm. and you know, he wasn't really religious, you know, or a lot of the black people that I knew were like, okay, give it up to God and then keep on going. Uh, just like a passing thing. They weren't too into it, but they always recognized it. I, I don't know. It, it's even up here. It's not too big of a thing. Yeah. I, I guess I was kind of lucky on that, but yeah, I, I'd say you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've definitely noticed in, uh, you know, from media coverage is that there's definitely problems in a lot of the country with, uh, institutional racism and and the like and black kids getting shot yeah i mean it, i i feel like it's a combination of things that all come together whether it be gun culture whether it be um the way you know systematic racism the way black people are viewed and and it seems to all come together to i mean in high crime obviously there's a lot of crime going on and black people definitely cl- commit a significant amount of crimes or at least get busted for it hmm? yeah i, I think or at least more get busted yeah yeah that they well, get yeah. caught more exactly they get caught more um and and fucking charges press on them harder than exactly they get longer time they get just looked at differently a lot of younger black and hispanic kids get tried as adults more than anyone else um so yeah i mean it's it's a whole combination of things that add up to a, an oppressed population, and then that has its own repercussions, and it's just this cycle. Well, one thing I picture of it that I, I've kind of uh, come to is that when you're part of a group that doesn't feel like the cops are taking care of you because they aren't giving you adequate assistance and are... Uh, an agent of of oppression, or even if if they're not much of an agent of oppression, but if you see them arresting a lot of your 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 friends and other members of your community, and they don't look like you or sound like you, it's that could very easily create um, a nasty nasty feedback loop. The cop become the enemy, and if if you view the cops as the enemy, then you're their enemy. Yeah, the cops felt like an occupying uh force um i my personal uh experience with cops was never a good one from like the age of 12 um i mean cops literally i've had cops uh attack us we well we started getting pulled over around eight, walk into middle school and oh. they would stretch us out on a car fuck are you guys doing Get over here. Get up against the car. And we were just doing nothing, just walking down the main street where, you know, everyone's oh, and, and and they would just I right. and then once they don't find I right, get your ass to school. And and just like shit like that too. I mean, I had a cop punch a friend in the face um because he smart mouthed him, you know? I had a cop hit me a, a few times too. Um it was just like it was so we, I mean, by the age of 13, I hated the police more than I hated anyone. I mean, I just, they, to me, set the tone and wh- how I should feel about society. And I clearly wasn't welcome in it. Um, 
just, and, and, and I didn't know trying this. to break people down. Yeah, and and I'm sure they were just like, hey, little assholes fucking commit crimes, you know? You, you, or just, I, I I don't know why they did it down, but I mean, I I'm trying to see because I don't think everyone is consciously racist or people who are racist are conscious of it. They just, you know, they've created this kind of image in their um, mind of, you know, those little fucking bastards. They're going to grow up to be fucking criminals anyway. Where the fuck do they? And I'm not saying we were like innocent kids, even though we were definitely innocent. We weren't. I, I don't remember doing anything bad at 12 or 13 or it wasn't in. It wasn't until like 10th grade until I became like an angry young kid. And we used to go around and be like, fuck the world. And and just, you know, we hated society pretty much. I, I grew to hate society. And I because in, in consciously, I didn't know what it was, but I just ended up hating it. And I I hated seeing like men in business suits and maybe because that's just was the epitome of what I would never be. I don't know what it was, but we were by, or me personally, I was probably the angriest out of all of my friends, even though some of them had like emotional issues and that's maybe why I could kind of influence them to do shit. But me, I was just an angry kid. So by the time I was about 15, I was just an angry kid, but I mean, a lot of it was just growing up. I mean, a lot of it had to do with my um, upbringing too. being in a house full of the devil and, you know, shit like that and being physically abused. But the thing that sits with me is walking down the street and having cops harass us. Adults. They didn't even have to be a cop. They were adults, but never mind. They're supposed to be the ones that serve and protect. You grow up. I remember growing up watching. Um, what was it? Family Matters, where Carl Winslow is a cop. Oh, and that's fuck. my that's image a- of a cop, you know, that's my image of, you know, and then I go out and there's these guys getting in our face and we're literally 12 and they're just, there's hatred and they treat us like criminals that totally like turned it, turned it on its head for me. And, and a few times I remember I was in a store, they accused us of shoplifting and even the customers were like, what the fuck are you talking about? Them kids aren't doing anything. And, and so pretty much you start to get the tone of how you're, how you're seen in society. And for me, that brought a lot of anger. Other people, it may have brought I don't know, you know, ways to try and separate themselves from whatever they feel like they're being connected to. But for me, it just brought a lot of anger and aggressiveness towards uh, just authority and society. And you know, one thing I think is worth pointing out is, you know, most cops are good cops who do a good job and take care of the people in their community. But there are definitely a lot of bad cops out there or at least a decent number of them, and there are some departments that have serious problems, institutionalized problems all the way through. And if it's only a few bad cops in your city that harass you, that's going to give you a really sour taste. Yeah. Because those are people with authority and guns. And even if there's only a few bad apples, that's that's terrible. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and I have friends who I, I have people I know that have been to jail who don't feel as angry as I feel towards cops because they've actually haven't had a worse uh, or uh, as bad experience with them, even though they've been through the system. Like, I, I'm, I'm not saying they're the norm, but, you know, so it's definitely it, my the way I see police um, is definitely based on my experience. But um yeah, so like like you said, it's not all cops. Just like not all Muslims are terrorists, you know. It's mm-hmm. like they're not definitely not, <laughs> and yeah, not all not black a- men are criminals. Exactly. So <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> uh, there, there was also something interesting. I, I'd like to get see if you have any insights on. Was historically, you look back at the history of gangs, and right now, gangs are the tendency is for them to be along. Uh, racial minority lines but it used to be that the big gangs were Irish and Polish and then you had the Italian Mafia the Irish and Polish gangs once Irish and Polish people started being viewed as just white people they stopped making gangs and they became cops that's why your stereotypical movie cop is Irish yeah yeah well, no, if, I, uh, bring him, bring him back, uh, Blazing Saddles for a second. I mean, uh, I remember there's that little line in the movie goes something like, "All right, we'll let the black people in, but we don't want any of the fucking Irish." Yeah, 
Yeah. That would have yeah. that movie would have been at the time when that process was hap- happening. Uh, yeah. Do you think there's a chance for the same thing to happen again with black people just becoming Americans and as, as how they're viewed by society and leaving gangs and becoming the police? Well, I think it's a lot harder because they're black and not white. Because after a while, an Irish person, because Irish person, Irish people were seen as like they were they were the monkeys. You know, they I, I remember I I was a sociology major and they I remember a teacher totally inappropriately. Uh, read this thing that I forget someone wrote. It was my social one on one class. And it was like, these people are descendants from apes and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like the only black person in class in this college. And he goes, so do you know who this was? Ishmael, the only black guy. And I know he expected me to say black people, <laughs> but I already knew it was the Irish. And I said, the Irish. And he was very surprised. Yes, it was the Irish. So Irish were looked at as dogs, like Irish need not apply and shit like that. Mm-hmm. But after a while, once they started to integ- integrate into society, they yeah. just became white. Like they're, they're just white people. And the same thing with Italians. Like when there were the Irish cops, they treated Italians like dirt. I mean, they also treated black people like dirt. But as far as other white people went, they treated them like shit, you know. But then sooner or later, they were able to become just white and black people can never become just white so we have oh, yeah. to get away from racism you know like you got to be really famous or really rich rich to become white kind of like exactly Mariah Carey. <laughs> yeah well i don't even know Mariah. Yeah. uh um uh will yeah, smith, Mariah, Mariah Carey will just smith got like and a, morgan a strong Freeman. suntan well, Mariah Carey, is she black? I don't even know what she... I don't know if she's black. I, I, I believe her parents are black and white. Oh, okay. But, like, but, the only people as far as, like, film who I feel like can, like, play a role that's not made for a, a white guy, I mean, for a black guy, and they can play a role for a white guy is Will Smith, is Morgan Freeman. I don't even know if Denzel... I Because I feel like even his roles, even though he's a quote-unquote respectable black man... He still plays respectable black roles like Sidney Portia, you know? Come on. Um, even Oprah. Yeah, Oprah had MCU. that experience. Huh? MCU. Come on, MCU. pull up the geek. Marvel Comics Universe. Who in... Mar- oh, wait. Are you going to say uh, Watch McCullough who just played... Uh- Samuel L.? No, no. What do you mean? He, <laughs> no, all- they've made him black, but they made the character is black. <laughs> he's not. It's not like it was a white guy. It's it's like that. That that's almost like saying, um, Spider Man. The new Spider Man is like he can cross racial lines. No, he's now half black, half Puerto Rican. I mean, like comics? literally, Will Smith yeah. has gotten roles that were written for white guys. It, like him being black has no play into in that role, is what I meant. Um, I suppose. Yeah. And Mariah Carey, her father is uh, African American and Afro Venezuelan, and her mother uh, was white Irish. Yeah, yeah. She never seemed necessarily black to me, but I mean, you know, whatever. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But no, I I just mean it. It'll be tough for color for race to no longer mean anything, especially in America. Someone so tied to race. So I mean, we're still dealing with issues now. I mean, statistically in every way, and even like I mean, just Obama becoming president. The funny thing is, like I said, I was a sociology major when I was in college in two thousand and one. I. I took classes with very liberal, very left wing uh, white people who would say, ah, there's no, they'd say racism. Come on. I mean, they're like, look, yeah, it's in the South. It's these toothless, nobody people. It wasn't until Obama started running that you saw, oh no, racism in just, isn't just in the South. It's people in politics. It's like you, you started to see the racist come out again. Cause for a while it was hard to argue that there was blatant racism in America. At least that's what I saw, especially in the nineties. And if something happened like the Rodney King thing, it's like, well, that was just those cops. I mean, it's not every cop. And that was just this. That was, but after Obama became president, we start with the whole Bertha with him being Muslim. It reignited like, Mm-hmm. race lines again it like it it and maybe in a way it's good because it brought it out and maybe we can kind of focus on it and and people like i said well-meaning liberals who just didn't see it 
They're just like, what are you talking about? Like, dude, come on. You're, you're just playing a race card, as they like to say, which to me essentially means acknowledging racism. Um, so I think in a way, the best thing was that when Obama became president, it kind of showed us racism isn't dead in the country. And it's still something we just need to focus on and, and hopefully deal away with however hard that's going to be. I mean, because as a country, we just have a lot of things going on. I feel like we're a country that lacks compassion and compassion in a lot of ways. We still are pro death penalty and pro guns and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not going to be easy, but hopefully one day it'll just be American. You know, I'm slowly overcoming the uh, death penalty. Uh, I, just, yeah, uh, that, that's a, that's a hard one for me to lose. Um, Really? I, I, it kind of is. I mean, I mean, I I get I totally get the revenge angle for families and and that's why I haven't given up on it completely. I mean, do I want it to go away? Yes, but I haven't had a close fi- family member get shot or killed either. That's interesting you that you're acknowledging that it has the it's it's the revenge cuz usually people try and pretend it's not. It's like this justice thing. And, but it is revenge. And, and to me, it's like a bloodlust thing. But I yeah. think that in itself is why we should do away with it. Cause the judicial system shouldn't be about revenge because right. that's, that's like mob mentality. That's, uh, vigilante mentality. That's where lynching came from. You know, it's like, let's string them up here and let's let the family play a role in it. You know? Um, but I, the, I mean, the fact that as far as the death penalty, we have more in common with, Muslim countries than we do with most Western nations or all Western <laughs> mm-hmm, nations. Yeah. That should yep. give us pause and say, well, then what's going on? What's wrong with us? Yeah. I have a bit of a nuanced view on it. I'd like to see it abolished in all 50 states, but kept available for serious crimes against society at the federal level. Hmm. I don't and know. And only, not any personal crimes, but if it's at the point where you know, society seriously feels wrong. I think in some cases it, it can be maybe worthwhile, but I'd prefer to see it never used. Like a crime so Trump, against humanity? Kind of yeah, Trump. Trump. Crimes <laughs> against humanity, uh, acts of terrorism, mass murder, uh, serial killers. You know, if you go around and you kill 40 prostitutes in a string across the country, I think... I wouldn't have a I wouldn't have a problem with society wanting that person's head. Mm, I've always found serial killers more a blotch on society because a lot of them kill. Well, not all, but I feel like the reason why they got away with it because they're prostitutes and because we didn't give a fuck about how many of them are dying and never looked into it. Because serial killers aren't these brilliant guys getting away with it. It's just that they know who to kill and no one puts mm-hmm. up a stink when it's a prostitute who's killed. I, I get what you're saying, but I still, because I almost feel like as far as terrorism, if you leave it for terrorism, I feel like it would be an honor. Oh, this country doesn't kill their criminals. I'm going to make them kill me. Not not that you should base your laws on you know oh. how they feel, <laughs> but I don't know. I just feel I would, like taking the like, life of another human, it's like, just put him in a cage. like. And for terrorism, I would res- reserve it for white Christian terrorists. <laughs> So it's uh, not Muslims. <laughs> that, that's just making the martyrs. White Christian terrorists. Your Timothy Mc, McVeigh's and the and the like. Yeah. <laughs> so so for the Muslims, were they going to work in like a, a meat packing plant for the rest of their life? <laughs> no, you go in the pork but, section, Ahmad. Get over there. <laughs> <laughs> Make bacon for us. <laughs> hey, would you like a shake? It's bacon flavored. <laughs> yeah, just make. All of their food, bacon flavor. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> That's cruel and unusual. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I've actually heard. Have, have you seen these bullets that they, they have bacon yes. put into them? <laughs> the, the pork bullets? Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, it's like, wait, if you don't believe that, it's like, it's such a spiteful, like, yeah, we know it's bullshit, but the fact that it's going to make their death even worse. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Hey, I'd probably do it too. I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't, but maybe if I was simple, I probably would. <laughs> or maybe just right. a good businessman. He's like, look, this is going to sell my bullets more than some other assholes' bullets. So what do you want? 
Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's got to make some money right there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, One last po- point I do want to make on, on the death penalty is I, I do take issue with the modern sanitized executions. Uh-oh. <laughs> which are now not all that sanitary. The Without having access to the, the good drugs from Europe, um, they're brutal, very not far from humane uh, the most recent executions and that should not be happening but it seems to me to be you know combining medicine with killing it's it's an attempt to do terrible horrible things and try to make it look pretty (laughs) and there is nothing pretty about it I agree but I think that's the only way we can keep the death penalty going. We're not going to have the electric chair. We're not going to the, the support for the death penalty would drop if we were still doing firing squads, if we were still doing electric chairs. They'd be like, this is barbaric, but it is barbaric, mm-hmm. even if they fucking fall asleep and never wake up. And that's the other part of my kind of nuanced view. I would only want it to be continued if hanging and firing squad are the only options. Yeah. If we're going to do wouldn't. something barbaric, it needs to be done barbarically. If we're oh, going to do something right. barbaric, fuck it. Let's just uh, make it into a pay-per-view. <laughs> throw them in a, I'm sure the Christians will love throwing them in a pit of lions or some shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. They'll love that. <laughs> yeah, but that wouldn't last, uh, you know, five years. But that's the thing. It's like... And that's uh, okay. I find it, yeah. Well... Uh, we, I don't know if what, when, when, I don't think we'll get rid of the death penalty anytime soon. Not while Christianity, the type of Christianity that a lot of Americans practice, um, is so prevalent in this country. It's just, we like punishment. We get yeah. off on punishment. Uh, it's perverse. Now, in the, uh, 90s in Oregon, there was a constitutional amendment that changed the definition of, the purpose of the correction system from rehabilitation to punishment. Really? I did not know that. That was in the 90s by a popular vote. Wow. And even if you show studies how it's worse for society, how it's better to actually try and rehabilitate them, how you shouldn't be in there trying to punish these guys, torture them, have them come out becoming worse individuals. They're like, no, why? I mean, what? He committed the crime. They don't care if it actually makes it more likely for these guys to get out and commit Mm -hmm. more crimes. They need that punishment. That, and, and I honestly feel like it's the Christian in them. It's the it's still followers of the Abrahamic revenge. religion. Huh? Well, you've got it, it's that still angle. all about revenge. Yeah, exactly. You've got that angle, and then you have the for-profit prisons who oh, they uh, don't uh, want effective punishment <laughs> or effective corrections because they want recidivism. Exactly. They want their customers to come back. Yeah. They have state sign will only come, or at least I remember a story. I won't say everyone does, but I remember a story, a particular uh, for-profit prison said, uh, had them sign will only come to your state if you uh, guarantee, like I think it was like 70 something percent uh, filled to capacity. So it's like you have to promise to arrest a lot of people. So was like, that Idaho? Oh, it may have been Idaho. I'm not. I. It was like it was. I wouldn't doubt if it's a, if it's a lot of places. Yeah, exactly. Idaho exactly. has. They've they've got a reform group working at the governor's direction to try to fix our our arrest and conviction rates because right now the incarceration rate is four times what it should be for wow. the actual crime rate. Wow. <laughs> The sentences are two to four times as long as they should be compared to every other state. (laughs) The state has recently had to take over for-profit prisons because of terrible abuses and cost-cutting measures. And the governor is under federal investigation for corruption and bribery involving these for-profit prisons. And in the middle of that investigation... He got elected to a third term. 
Of course. <laughs> Fucking Butch Otter. Oh my god, that's beautiful. And he, his name is Butch. At least he goes by Butch. Butch Otter? <laughs> Butch Otter. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I was about to say, how ironic if he was like uh, some guy who butchered otters and that was a bad joke. But then I thought of, remember that woman that was running for uh, some kind of public uh, role in... Um, was it Iowa or I? Uh, I think it was Iowa, and she talked about like I. I have a background castrating pigs. Do you remember that? When she <laughs> Senator was- Joni Ernst from <laughs> I think she's Nebraska or Iowa. Was it? It was like really? Iowa or one of them. Nice. Was- <laughs> she is now a U.S. senator. Oh my oh, so, motherfucker! It hurt. She had a commercial about castrating pigs, and and do you remember the guy who was running against her? He talked about how his uh, sister was like murdered brutally in her home, and it was like he kind of made a joke in the commercial, like, "But if I, you know, but I have a gun here," and it was like, "Wait, you're just talking about a family member brutally murdered," and it kind of has like a little hook of a joke within that same commercial about oh. him being a tough. Uh, you got to look it up. It is like uh, you have. They're just terrible humans. All right, they just. <laughs> Uh, how are you still like what year is this that we're like hey i castrate pigs vote for me <laughs> and what's crazy she was running on that she's a retired u.s army colonel <laughs> really <laughs> and Man, she went would... for the pig castration <laughs> fuck yeah get him by the nuts right yeah right. she said something about cutting pork right and i'll cut pork yeah. while i'm in the... <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh. That that's that's almost as bad as fucking uh, Opal Covey. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Opal. <laughs> Opal is a, a treasure. She's a trip. <laughs> yeah, but Opal Covey lost, and she yeah. was only running for mayor. Joni Ernst is the fucking United States senator. Wow. Yeah, but Opal from Covey Iowa. still got still got a few hundred votes this year. And I'd be watching those people closely. <laughs> but Opal Covey would be, yeah, you're right. Entertaining. You're right. Yeah. Uh, she was speaking in tongues. Uh, I remember playing that video. She's hilarious. <laughs> She's like, oh, Everybody oh, had to play that one. Oh, yeah. yeah it's that's too good. Shamalama yeah. ding dong. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, Michael who said chicken and a chicken and a watermelon or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a that was a weird talk you guys had. Yeah. Uh, anyways, oh my those God. are the best when they kind of go off the rails. We actually had a good one this past week. Um, at least we got a lot of good feedback where her and I went at it about um, Christianity because I kind of got uh, I wanted to talk about you know those thirteen black women who were raped by the cop. Um, yeah. what Daniel Holt's claw, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, one of the women or the woman who started the investigation in her, uh, news conference, um, uh, talk. She talked about, uh, just, you know, everything. The thing that stood out to me was when she thanked God. She thanked God to allow her to live. And I kind of, and I just wanted to talk about that. And Kim was totally against it. It's why are you trying to take God from him? And it was good. We had a long back and forth and I got really into it. And I want to have more of that too, because that's what I don't want. I don't like agreeing, you know. Like I rather argue. I rather kind of debate my points. And the fact that she's not uh, atheist, we should do that more. Mm-hmm. But I, she's not quick to want to do it. But I, I think now that you know we got good feedback, I'm gonna try and talk her into doing it more. Because for me, that's what I want to do. I don't want to get on there and just agree, and we all agree and. <laughs> I rather, you know, that's why I'm actually, like I was saying, I'm trying to bring more people on who disagree with me so we can have a real discussion about something instead of just talking about how Christians are idiots. And sh- Well, one of uh, Holtz Claw's victims, like you're saying, you know, pr- uh, thanking God that, you know, he let her survive, get through all that. I always like, why did he let it happen in the fuck- first fucking That was place? my point. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'm like, why are you yeah. thanking God and what? You know, it's just and uh, yeah, shit, shit like that. Because to me, it was no different. Because she said, well, maybe God help her get through. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about her thanking God. And I brought up like an example of you know cancer patients who go through this, who go through the surgery, go through the chemo, and then they're like, yeah, thank God for getting me through it. Or someone who survives a fucking storm, uh, a tornado, and it destroyed their house, but their Bible was still there undestroyed thank god <laughs> that's the shit i'm like man what do you like i have a, a, a fucking 9 11 uh the, the fucking cross. buildings come down and go go figure that you know a building that's made out of cross beams <laughs> there's gonna be a fucking cross exactly mm-hmm. yeah and 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 like i was saying i'm really aggressive with my family so when my sister my sister and i don't talk as much and it's not because we hate each other or anything we love each other but i just can't bite my tongue like the last time we talked she talked about something about um uh, God helping her do something. It could have been like get a job or something. And I was like, really? How many kids died while, while you're, while God helped you get a job? How many? I'm like, how? I'm, I'm like, how? And, and I know that's mean. And it's like, but I'm like, so you think your God helps you get a fucking job while there was probably some kid being raped and murdered out there? Like, what does that say about you and your view of the world and your view of God? Well, is your sister into the prosperity gospel, though? Uh, I don't think so. We haven't talked about okay, I, I don't think she's a prosperity gospel. Because that shit always pisses me the fuck off. Because just like you're saying, you know, oh, fucking gold's coming my way. But yeah, fuck all the poor people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's uh, that's and, and I love like like when uh, uh, what's it? Rolo Dollar, whatever it was. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, oh, uh, Creflo Cref- Dollar. Creflo, yeah, Creflo Dollar. Creflo, um, yeah. When he's in a church full of people, probably the majority of them struggling, he's like, and if God wants me to get a plane, this is after he got shit for trying to get the plane. And his congregation oh, yeah. are still like, he's like, if God wants me to get a plane, you, you know, I forget what he says, like, who are they to deny it? And they're all clapping. And I'm thinking, how many of you motherfuckers want a plane? And how many of you guys are going to get it? And you're clapping to give him money to get it. Uh, I'll never get that shit, man. <laughs> never. Ta- you know, nice tailored suits, <laughs> fucking Rolexes oh and shit. Oh my gosh, yeah. Million dollar mansion. Yeah. Yep. Fuck him. Yeah. Uh, fuck uh, all the prosperity. Yeah, what's, what, what's the guy with the great smile? Oh, Mr. Shiny Face. <laughs> what's yeah. his name? He's an asshole, oh, too. Oh. Kenneth Colin? Couple? Nah, it's no, him and his wife. No. They, they He's have got like the thousands perfectly of dollars coiffed stole. brown hair. Stolen from them out of the safe recently, oh, like six hundred thousand from like just a day's um, uh, tithing or whatever, a, a collection plate money. He said was stolen. I don't. He's young, good looking. He ha- he must have fake teeth because they're like perfect teeth. Oh yeah, uh, Joe, Joe Osteen. Osteen. Yes, him. Mm, uh, yeah, he is. Uh, he's tough to listen to because you. He talks like All he's right. for the people. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we are out of time. This has been a whole lot of fun. Uh, where can uh, where can people find your show? People can find me. You can go to angryblackrant.com, and that's rant, R-A-N-T, um, dot com. And uh, you can find me there, or you can just go to the regular places, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever, you know, the normal podcasting places. Or go to Facebook slash Angry Black Rant. Are you on the Twitters? Yeah, I'm on the Twitters at Angry Black Rant. So I'm easy to oh. find there as well. So everything is basically Angry Black Rant. My email is Ishmael, I-S-H-M-A-E-L, at angryblackrant.com. All right. And the links will all be in the show notes. Cool. Thank you very much for joining us. And for our listeners, we'll be back next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.